Okay. Um, and let me just, let's see if I can mute people. Uh, you know, I'm not going to worry about that if somebody else wants to. Um, well, I just, uh, I think we'll go ahead and get started. I want to welcome everybody to the, um, to the Merck, the virtual Merck here, the Mercury Cafe. We have, this is uh, our revolution and working families party. We have a, a monthly meeting the second Wednesday of every month. We, we've done it for a long time, but we kind of were on hiatus last year um, with COVID and we're now back virtually at the Merck. We've always held these meetings at the Merck, Mercury Cafe, great progressive uh, organization uh, supporting uh, causes and candidates. And so we're uh, reviving the, uh, the effort here and, and we're back on our schedule of every second Wednesday. So uh, look for something coming up in March, a month from today. Uh, but today we're gonna talk about voting primarily, um, voting techniques, uh, voting systems, uh, ranked choice voting and approval voting as two options that Denver's considering um, and other places are considering and enacting. Uh, but before we get going, I want to introduce, um, and I'm Owen Perkins from Our Revolution, I want to introduce um, our founding uh, member from Our Revolution Metro Denver, Neil Lynch, to start us off and just uh, get us going this, uh, this evening. Hi, thanks Owen. So welcome everybody. And um, we're just going to do a very quick thing on maybe a little bit of a little bit because uh, we've had so much serious stuff going on and even today was serious. I watched the hearings and pretty emotional. So I know there's probably not anybody on here who didn't see the Bernie memes with the mittens. But it might be kind of fun. <laughs> or is there anybody who didn't see them? <laughs> so we thought it might be kind of fun if we start with, we had about six of them, I think, five or six, to kind of scroll through these and... Yeah. You can take a look. So here's one and start thinking about what you think is your favorite. So there's one of them. Now, I don't know, some of you who don't watch TV might not know the significance of this one. Okay, you want to go to the next one, Owen? Oops. Um, this one, if, if you've been in Denver a long time, you know what this is. And actually, they called it Casa Bonita on the memes. So that's number two. <laughs> now, <laughs> this needs no introduction, right? <laughs> we'll never forget that time when the bird landed on Bernie's podium. That was just, I don't know. So that's number three. This is number four. And I don't know if anybody doesn't get this one, you are not with it. <laughs> okay. Number the last one. <laughs> okay, so um Owen, do you want to go to that next screen that I think has them as a composite? So if y'all would just look at these and think about, and I know there are some that are better, we all had favorites, but think about which one of these is your favorite that you would vote for. One, two, three, four, or five. And uh, if you're on visual, we thought maybe the easiest thing is maybe just to raise your hand. Of uh, So how many people were, Oops, can we go back? Well, um, I, we can't see them raising their hands if we're on well, that screen. And, and how uh, do we want to vote? Do we want to use approval voting or well, do we want to use ranked choice? You know, I actually thought about that, that this would have been a good chance to, to practice them, but I don't think we'll do that. Um, okay, well, I don't have it in front of me. Um, so number one uh, was um, the chess movie. Uh, chess show. Okay, I think I saw Owen vote for that. Anybody? Won, huh? Anybody raising science? your hand for number one? Okay, we have two people. Two. Okay. okay. 
And then the second one uh, was, I can't remember what the second one was. second one was <laughs> Casa Cafe. Oh, yeah. Casa Bonita. Casa, Casa Bernita. <laughs> one. That's me. Okay, one for that. Okay, number three. The birdie. The Bernie Bird. Bernie Bird. No vote. One. One. Oh, one vote. Okay, number four was Schitt's Creek. Schitt's Creek. One, two. I see okay. two. Okay, and then number five was the wardrobe. One. <laughs> Again. <laughs> see, we need, I think what this shows us is we need a different system of voting. I, yes. think, I yes. think it is proof because we get a tie and then we'd have to have a runoff. And I think there is absolute proof of that. So would uh, somebody, okay, the ones that won were, um, uh, what were they again? I'm trying to think. Was uh, the, the last Creek. one. Yeah, Schitt's Creek. Schitt's Creek. And I think the first one. I think there yeah. were two on the first one, yeah. Okay, so someone, why did you vote for um, the first one, the chess TV show? Who voted for that? And tell us why you just thought that was the best. I did. I, I can't really explain it because I, I don't have, I, I'm short on my little green pills and I'm not acting the way I know. <laughs> All right. And you don't, have to, defend, you don't have to defend your vote. Okay. <laughs> what about Schitt's Creek? Felix, I think you voted for that. Uh, yeah, actually, I kind of laughed because I've only just started watching it. Like, we're literally on episode three because my wife is like, you must watch this show if you don't watch this. Like, it was, everything was on the line. And um, I, I, I just told her while I was on mute, like, thank you. I'm like now up on trivia. <laughs> okay, Funny. good. Well, thank y'all for doing that. And I think we do need to remember humor and levity and thank you for doing that. I'll hand it back to you, Owen. Okay. Um, Gary, do you have your slide ready? Or? Uh, I, um, can you, I have a flaky internet connection okay. today. You, so I'm actually on uh, using the phone for audio. Okay. And uh, because of the poor connection, I'm going to leave my video off. No so problem. If you could share the slide I sent you. Okay. I'll just take a couple minutes to speak. Um, <clears throat> I'm Gary Todd. I'm one of the co-leads of ORMD. I want to thank everyone for coming tonight. And I just have a very brief announcement. Uh, some of you may have completed um, a recent survey we sent out asking for uh, member input on priorities for our issue advocacy this year. So as you, uh, most of you probably know, uh, ORMD uh, puts a lot of effort into endorsements when we start to get into campaign seasons. And prior to that, um, in uh, particularly in off years like this year, uh, we're gonna try to put some energy into issue advocacy. So we did a survey asking for input on what we should prioritize. There are so many important progressive issues, we just don't have the resources to address them all. And uh, we identified three based on that input, uh, Medicare for All, uh, Green New Deal slash Environmental Justice, and Campaign Finance Reform. So we are going to be formulating uh, action campaigns, working in collaboration with uh, organizations that go after specific issues and provide some infrastructure where we can um, you know, provide um, uh, avenues for our members to get involved. For instance, on Medicare for All, we're going to be collaborating with uh, National Nurses United, which is leading an effort in support of uh, Medicare for All legislation, which is gonna be introduced probably in the next couple of weeks. And we'll be planning to join their phone banks and actually uh, hope to set up some of our own phone banks to um, reach out to 
uh, Colorado's representatives and make sure they know how important Medicare for all is to the citizens of Colorado. And we'll have similar actions planned relative to the environment and to campaign finance reform. So if you don't get our newsletter, um, send a request to our Revolution Metro Denver with r.revolution.metro.denver at gmail, you can see on the slide, or follow us on, on Twitter or our Facebook page, and you'll see what we're up to. We hope you'll join us and volunteer as much time as you can into these efforts. Thanks so much, and thank you again for coming tonight. Thanks, Owen. Great. Um, well, I'll just, Kaylee, I'll give you a heads up that, you know, you'll be up next, and so if you get ready to share your screen. Um, and let me just set this up a little bit and introduce our two guests. We've got um, Kaylee LeQuay, uh, the community organizer from uh, Denver Approves. She's going to talk to us about approval voting to start off with. And then Emma Donahue, the political director from Ranked Choice Voting Colorado, will talk to us about Ranked Choice Voting. And I just want to give just a half a minute of background. Denver um, does hope that the clerk's office, I think, has a goal of putting something before voters this November to change our municipal election voting system. Um, either, you know, um, they're still in the process of rolling everything out, but um, they're considering going to approval voting, considering going to ranked choice voting, considering going just to plurality voting, which means um, we wouldn't have any runoffs. We, 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 we wouldn't need a majority. Just whoever gets the most votes would win. And uh, considering some scenario where there's more time in between elections, the issue that's prompting Denver is that we kind of have a time conflict with our charter right now that we're required that as a city, Denver, to send out ballots overseas, for example, 45 days before an election. But when we have a May election and a June runoff, the date for sending out the June runoff actually comes before the May election. So we're trying to find solutions um, in Denver um, that would you know, solve that charter time conflict and put us back in sync um, and give us um, the best possible outcome and maybe uh, different uh, factors that would go into that, saving costs perhaps, um, finding the best time to do it. But uh, two of the primary alternatives are um, approval voting and ranked choice voting. So we're going to take 20 minutes um, from each presenter followed by 10 minutes from for each presenter of questions. So a half hour total on each for an hour total altogether. And uh, so we will start with Kaylee. If you're ready to share your screen, go ahead. And um, I'll give you a, like a two minute warning when we're getting close to the end, but you go ahead whenever you're ready. All right, so here we go. And I think you're on mute. So, yep. Can everybody see my screen and everybody hear me okay? Cool, see nods. So my name is Kaylee. I am um, a community organizer with the Denver Approves Campaign. And as Owen said, our um, city council and a Denver Charter Review Committee is considering alternative voting methods and they're going to make a recommendation in the coming weeks um, between approval voting and ranked choice voting. There and so I want to talk to you a little bit about what approval voting is and how it would work for our city. Um, I think that we have seen, you know, lots of different things play out, especially at the municipal level uh, in the past couple years, and we need change. Um, there are lots of issues with plurality voting and approval voting um, solves a lot of them. I think you know you can always vote for your favorite candidate, whether they have a good or you know bad chance of winning. I think the electability argument is um, you know something that encourages negative campaigning, and we don't have to deal with that when you can vote for every candidate that you like on the ballot, um, and you can truly express your viewpoint and have a say in um, more ways than one. 
you can more fully express how you feel, you can vote yes or no on every candidate if you want to. And it gets rid of this idea of third party spoilers and voting between the lesser of two evils. Um, and it, approval voting greatly reduces the risk of this vote splitting problem, especially among similar candidates. We have, you know, differing ideas and no city, Denver specifically, is a monolith. Um, but, you know, winning candidates will have broader support from voters, a true consensus, um, and more people will be satisfied. One voting, having worked in politics and having kind of seen like how the sausage gets made and where we're at politically uh, at a municipal and a state level with like managing elections um, is that it's approval voting is quick to implement our voting machines uh, and our voting ballots that we currently use and that voters are Denver voters are used to um, don't really have to go through much change um, and the results are easy to understand basically you remove the mandate that says you can only vote for one and that's it um, so like I said, um, we are used to ballots that look like this, and there doesn't have to be a lot of change under an approval voting system. <laughs> approval voting uh, only requires, oops, sorry. It only requires addition, uh, simple math, and you are getting a spread of who has the most votes across you know, an array of candidates, uh, the candidate with the most votes wins. Um, results from multi-candidate elections are easily shown in a bar graph form. Um, and then you have, you know, other voting methods can get, that can get really in the weeds and really complex. Um, this is one example of, uh, um, I believe it was Berkeley, after the first five rounds had been eliminated and all of the score tallying were- This is um, Oakland. O Oakland, thank you, Felix. Um, which can be a lot more involved and, um, as Owen mentioned, lead into multiple runoffs, um, which can be costly to implement as well. Ooh. One of the things that I really like as well about um, circling back to this argument of electability, approval voting eliminates the barriers for new candidates and our current system, as we know, can create barriers to entry um, by giving new candidates really, really artificially low support, um, which is a consequence when uh, we are afraid that, you know, a candidate might not be as electable or they haven't raised as much funds, um, et cetera, et cetera, or, you know, it's a long shot, but we've seen, you know, Mavericks and progressives truly, you know, show via, on a national stage like Cori Bush, underdogs like AOC, that change can happen. And one of the things that I know I'm really excited about that's happening in Denver is the passage of 2E and approval voting um, is a really, really wonderful complement to that, I think. Um, as we saw, you know, y'all were talking about Medicare for all, Green New Deal, a lot of Bernie's policies, they're widely popular. Progressive ideas are popular. And when you have something like approval voting and candidates who share similar platforms are in a race with people who share that ideology, you're incentivizing, you know, what really sets them apart and, you know, not just making empty promises because approval voting means that you have to kind of, you can't tailor your message and ignore wide swaths of voters. You have to, you know, talk to everyone in the city of Denver. Um, and it puts an emphasis on genuine campaigning um, rather than, you know, unambiguous, like vague, vague lofty claims, excuse me. <laughs> it is cost effective, as I mentioned, uh, this is a brief screenshot from our own Secretary of State um, after a brief overview of what it would look like um, you know, our voting systems are capable of tabulating and reporting results. There would definitely need to be updates, but as I mentioned, people are used to, you know, a ballot that looks the same, that we just removed that mandate to just vote for one. Um, 
and we can do it already. And as I mentioned before, you know, with COVID and mail-in ballots, Colorado already has really strong uh, voter laws. Um, I've lived in other states and I'm really, I love and always look forward to voting in Denver. I feel uh, informed and, you know, there's a lot of really great stuff that happens there, but um, you know, nearly a million dollars has been cut from the Denver elections budget uh, just since COVID, or 980,000, excuse me, so almost a million. Um, and primaries and runoffs that could kind of go, come into play, multiple runoffs for municipal elections under other alternative voting methods um, are expensive. <clears throat> And I, as I mentioned to E before, you know, we want change. Denver voters want change and fair elections. Um, this graph at the top, you know, shows that, you know, I think some of the problems with our current system, you know, campaign finance reform and getting money out of politics and entrenched incumbents, you don't have that with a more fair, uh, open and transparent system um, that Denver is trying to build with approval voting. And so I think it would be a really incredible compliment to something like 2E where, you know, we will have a more even playing field to, you know, truly see what vo Denver voters want. Um, so it is transparent, it's flexible, it's easy to understand. And it has been successful in many other places. Uh, Fargo, North Dakota became the first in the country to um, hold uh, an approval voting election in June of last year. And that was reform Fargo campaign really did make history. 71% um, of uh, voters said that approval voting was easy. 62% said they liked it. Uh, I've heard concerns about you know, making sure that voters don't get confused. But again, I think that, you know, something like this that is really as simple as saying you can vote for as many candidates as you like um, is a really simple, straightforward thing, you know, in a city like Denver where we already have such great, you know, like the blue books come and everybody, <laughs> um, they do a really great job of informing voters for um, changes, potential changes like this. Uh, St. Louis in November of last year uh, voted overwhelmingly to um, implement approval but vote splitting um, and one of the least favorite and preferred candidates actually taking it uh, for their mayoral race. Um, so 68% of St. Louis voters supported that. Uh, and it will vote next month using approval voting for the first time, which is super exciting. There are many campaigns that are getting up and running in large cities across the US um, and entire regions. And yeah, I'm really excited and I hope that Denver becomes the next one. Um, this is one of the um, St. Louis candidates. And when I mentioned the vote splitting issue, you know, this is really what it comes down to. And I think that approval voting can still, um, it, it shows us what a true, you know, consensus and democratic um, access to our system looks like. Um, you don't have, you know, this third party spoiler candidate where an actually not very popular candidate takes it for a number of reasons. Um, and as Representative Rasheen Aldridge says, that's not how our democracy is intended to work. Um, and that is pretty much what I've got for you. <laughs> and we're gonna go to, I was not paying attention to time at all, but I'm- <laughs> You got plenty of time. All right, Felix, what have I missed? Oh, boy, I don't think you missed anything. Um, I, I, I would much rather people ask questions and then if we can dive into that, I should introduce myself. My name is Felix Sargent. I'm the chair of the board for the Center for Election Science. Um, that means, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not paid to be here. I'm just a big fan of, of, of the organization and got involved. Um, but I'm here to answer any, any more questions because I've been working with Center for Election Science for about four years now. And um, is somebody, one of our co-hosts, um, 
kind of monitoring questions? And does somebody want to, Anita, are you monitoring questions? No, I'm not, I'm oh. not monitoring, but I just well, I'm actually, I'm looking and I'm seeing a, a lot of comments and opinions. Uh -huh. um, I'm not necessarily seeing questions, but I will ask a question. Um, since you, you know, you're out speaking about this, what are sort of the concerns that you see raised or some of the cons that get brought up with the approval voting? And then just talk about like also what you think are the, the biggest pros to this. Um, I think the, the, the first thing that we get is, um, uh, well, what about bullet voting, right? That's, that's the first thing people come out of the gate, um, which is if you're just going to vote for one, like if, if candidates are going to encourage people to just vote for them and then not, you know, you know you're not going to get any, any of the advantages of approval voting, so it's not worth switching to it. Uh, and there are two really big reasons that that's wrong. Um, the first and foremost is candidates can encourage people to do whatever they like. That's not necessarily how people vote. And we have uh, proven results in Fargo, North Dakota, that people use the option of being able to vote for more candidates than there are seats available so that they're able to fully describe their opinions about saying like, these people are fine, these people aren't fine. Um, the second um, is the, that the difference in, even if you just vote for for one candidate. You're voting for your favorite candidate, whereas uh, right now in, uh, you know, in plurality, you're going to be strategic with that single vote because you think that that, that single vote isn't going to matter if you vote, if you vote for Nader and not, and not Gore. Okay, well, well what's the point? Um, you know, Nader's never going to win. That vote's going to go to waste. Whereas in approval voting, you can vote for Nader and Gore. Um, or you can just vote for Nader if that's really a truly honest favorite, you can do that, but you know you won't be throwing your vote, vote away. And so people's opinions or how they might vote may change with polling, but that's really all up to how that individual voter um, chooses to vote. And that's where the power needs to be with the voter to make that decision. Um, I've got a second one, but I think I should go to another question if you... Yeah, so we've got um, <clears throat> Nita and Skip. Uh, Nita has her hand up and Skip has his virtual hand up. So. Um, why don't we go to those two and Susan, uh, let us know if somebody else is in the queue, but Nita. Hi. So what's to keep someone from gaming this? Because I remember when I was voting, I was doing ranked choice voting when Working Families Party was voting for who they were going to endorse. And I wanted Bernie. <laughs> I wanted mm -hmm. Bernie and I knew Elizabeth Warren would probably be in the running. And I'm not smart enough to know how to game it, but I tried to game it by putting Bernie number one and Elizabeth Warren number six or seven or whatever. And even though she really would have been my second choice, I wanted Bernie to get it. So I don't know if I gamed it or not, but what is to keep, how could somebody, I mean, I, get, I think you can game any system probably, but what, how would someone game this? How yeah. do you not game it? <laughs> Well, the nice thing, the, the reason why the Center for Election Science, after studying all the various different voting methods that were out there and, and, and had been theorized, had gone to approval voting was that uh, your honest and your tactical choices are the same in under approval voting. You're, you know, if, if you only want Bernie and, and, you know, there are 100 candidates out there, you know, in a theoretical election, but that's the only person you want, great, vote that way. It's not a problem because every candidate is independent of every other candidate, right? Mm -hmm. It is, you know, just because you have, you know, one friend over here doesn't make this other person any less of a friend. So you just say like, okay, well, who are all my friends? You're not voting for your favorite. You're voting, you're giving a thumbs up or a thumbs down to every single candidate. And that's nice because that means that when the candidate gets their results, they say, hey, I have 76% approval. Um, and okay, great. That 76% of people approve of you. That's, that's, that's your score. It, it, it really couldn't be simpler. And so there's no way to strategize about it. I suppose in your world, you, you know, you would be asking yourself the question where, well, I like Warren and I like Bernie. Should I have to appro approve of both of them? And it does come down to the polls, right? If Bernie and Warren are neck and neck, you should vote for your you should vote for your favorite and shouldn't vote for Warren because you want there to be a difference there. If if you know Warren's uh, if if Bernie's like way in the lead, but you also like Warren, you can you can give her a vote. That's no problem. Um, 
you know, it, it's, it's up for you to, to decide that. Uh, and ultimately, you need to be comfortable with that at the end of the day, one of the candidates who you approved of got elected. And, and that's ultimately what we want. And what we see is, is people getting elected with, with, with much higher numbers than when they try to divide up the pie. Okay, Skip, you're, you're next. And then Noah, you're on deck. Sure, thank you. Um, just a little background very quickly. Uh, State Party approved alternative forms of voting for this set of reorgs, including approval voting and instant runoff voting, which is a form of ranked choice for the counties to proceed with if they, pro if they chose to do so. Some of the larger counties that have to um, that have more than one or two people running for the same position and also need to fill a number of positions on what we call the state central committee, which is the governing Congress of their state party, um, have chosen to use approval voting. Um, so Jeffco and I believe Denver is, El Paso did, a couple of other counties did, primarily because they had to fill more than one slot on the same ballot. Uh, they were using Survey Monkey for the most part. A lot of this is is happening primarily because of COVID, so we can't have any in-person meetings. My question to you is: If you've got, for example, eight positions that you need to fill, and you've got 24 people running for those eight positions on approval voting, what most people are doing is they're just simply marking off the eight people that they prefer. Now that's what we are calling approval voting. Is that approval voting to you? And is there a different way to do that that would be approval and still be workable? I guess I'm looking for alternatives because um, I'm one of the guys that's in charge of making sure that this thing works. Yeah, so it depends on what the role of the committee is. Um, and generally, when you're elect electing a council or a board, um, then uh, one of the things you're looking for is a diversity of opinions, right? And, and with that, you should go for a method, that, a method that is proportional, which says that, like, you know, ev every group of people deserves a seat, right? It's not about, let's, let's say you have a block of people that are 60% the, of, the, of the population, they all vote the same way. Um, and, uh, you know, if they all vote the same way, then whatever they want, they'll get, right? And, and, and that can be, that can be pretty bad. So uh, having a proportional method is, is something that'll make that much more effective, which uh, says, you know, once the first person gets the, once the person with the most votes gets the first seat, everyone who has been satisfied, they can take a step back and, and, and let people who haven't been satisfied uh, elect the next person. Um, I can talk to you more about that in the chat. There are some resources there. Um, is that approval voting, the, the method that you lined out? So it is, only approval voting when there is not a limit to the number of votes that you can emit. So you said that there were uh, 20 people, but there were eight seats available. Now, if you could only vote for up to eight people, that is not approval voting. That is called plurality at large. And it is a terrible system for exactly the reasons I, I, I mentioned, which is, uh, you know, the majority will fill the entire committee and you won't have diversity on it. Um, Whereas um, you know, approval will will be significantly will be significantly better, but it's still not proportional, and um, proportionality is is really what's what's necessary. Well, I guess I have a follow up because the I guess I need to find out more information. I've been trying to find information about this because we needed to actually have this all done two weeks ago. Well, so the Center for Election future, Sciences. Oh, sorry. Let me just say, it, in the future, it would be great. I'm going to put my email in, in the text, and you can send me stuff, okay? Absolutely great. I mean, this is why the Center for Election Science was founded, is that there needs to be a resource available for this kind of information. Perfect. Okay. And then I think we have time for at least one more question, right? Oh, we, and I we, think that's Noah. We got more time than that if we need it. Okay. But I've got a question, too. My hand. That's okay. No, Noah's had his hand up, so you're next. <laughs> Hey Susan, can you hear me okay? Yep. Great. 
Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm kind of new to approval voting. I'm very familiar with ranked choice voting. Um, but what I, so maybe I'm not fully understanding it, but um, I'm having trouble understanding, like take the scenario of uh, Nader, Gore, Bush. Um, and so let's say I really support Nader um, and I don't understand how if we had approval voting, um, I wouldn't be throwing my vote away if I just voted for Nader. Um, because, you know, I, I guess maybe it's under the assumption that with that system, he, he doesn't, he, you're not thinking of him as unelectable in that situation. Although when you're up against a juggernaut, like establishment politicians, it seems like you kind of are. So, um, I would have to either decide, um, to just vote for Nader with the potential that I'm throwing my vote away, or I would vote for uh, Nader and Gore uh, to suggest, well, I could tolerate Gore, even though I really uh, much more aligned with Nader, but there's not, it doesn't seem like there's really a way to differentiate. Um, and one thing we were talking about earlier is like, you know, like when Nita brought up about wanting Bernie uh, to win, um, it was suggested that, well, she could just vote for Bernie and not vote for Warren. Um, but in that case, you're not really approving of candidates that you kind of are more in alignment with than uh, the potential for, for like, you know, in the, in the uh, Nader, Bush, Gore scenario, like, the potential for resulting in having a Bush win, you know, so I, there's a question in there somewhere, but I guess it's just yeah. not knowing where, how that's not throwing your vote away. Is it, is that, is there something I'm missing in that? For sure. And so uh, I, I really, really appreciate your question. And, and I think that that's, I think that's the, the biggest hurdle to, to jump over when, when switching to approval voting is, is this question of, well, okay, but how do I vote? And, and, and how can I vote? And how do I make sure that I communicate as much information onto the ballot as I, as I, as I can in that scenario? And um, so there are two things that I want to address. The first one is, is that uh, you will always, always, always vote for your favorite, right? Under approval voting, because every candidate is independent, you can always vote for your favorite. And then you can say like, well, but my favorite probably isn't the most popular person right now. So I'm going to approve of these other people. And you can draw the line of how that goes, you know, further and further out. So for example, in, in, in Gore, Nader, Bush, right? If you vote, if you really like Nader, you probably also like Gore. And you know that Gore and Nader are neck and neck, sorry, that, that, that Gore and Bush are neck and neck. And you want to make sure that, that Gore has some support. And think about it this way. Don't ask yourself, ask yourself, do you like Gore? Yes, good, vote for Gore. Do you like Bush? If, 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 do, you, do you like Nader? Great, yes, vote for Nader. Do you like Bush? No, okay, don't vote for, don't vote for Bush. And um, that's the, the simplicity to the decision. Now, if you're like, you know what? I really don't like Gore. Don't vote for Gore. But uh, what happens in the, in the larger election is everyone gets to vote that way. It really is a contest between all of the various different candidates that happen. Um, and so uh, if we were to run that poll, uh, let's say we could rerun the 2000 election all over again, would Gore have a higher approval rating than Bush? Very, very likely. So the question of how you vote isn't the most important thing. It's the question of how does everyone vote and how do their votes get counted? And this is the big problem that you encounter with ranked choice voting in that only your, number, your, your first choice vote is ever counted until that candidate is eliminated, right? And so it's very easy for you to also have the spoiler effect in, um, in ranked choice voting um, when the person who's in the middle is a moderate. And so if you have a moderate uh, uh, in, in ranked choice voting, those, when that person gets eliminated, those votes can go off to your opponent 
and help defeat the person who you liked, uh, who liked most. And that's the risk. And that's why it's so important to have every candidate be independent and running just for themselves. Did that explain anything, Noah? I just want to check in with you. Uh, yeah, kind of, but I, I'm, I'm not, I'm still not really convinced that I, I would, um, I mean, because there was an assumption that you made that I, if I like Nader, then I probably also like Gore. And it, I think it's a matter of extremes, you know, because like, there's people that really hate uh, the um, corporate oligarchy and wouldn't would you know despise that taking power but when it's between that and the republicans and and the right-wing extremism yeah i mean i but but like that's sort of the scenario that we're trying to get away from you know and um so i feel like it does seem it does seem to me like on an individual level and that's how we vote we vote on an individual level um, it, I, it's, I'm throwing my vote away if I just vote for Nader in this case. And, and then, you know, we're going to have all these discussions on online and like, like we do about strategic voting and, you know, um, people are going to be telling me, well, uh, you got to vote for Nader and Gore. I don't want to vote for Gore. He's, yeah. you know, he's taking money from blah, 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 from the fossil fuel industry. You vote for Gore, you know, we need <laughs> uh, you to vote two for minute Gore. Warning here. In, yeah. So anyway. Right. And, and just to, to cap that off, like I would say, you know what? Don't vote for Gore. But another big, big advantage in approval voting is that it's so much easier for a lot of candidates to run. Where, you know, uh, in, even in ranked choice voting, there are lots of, um, I think the New York, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Linda, you'll know, um, the, the New York ballot is limited to the number of people you can rank. So you can only rank like four or five candidates. You actually can't rank as many candidates as you like. And like, um, you know, there's a big question of like, how do we encourage more candidates to run? So there can be a candidate like Bernie, where, you know, uh, they, <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of, better than Nader, supposedly, and, and, and also can capture, you know, a lot of the, the feelings of people and be a better representative. Um, and so you need a system that, that helps more candidates run. Can I just say, I thought David had a really good comment. He said, what, what would really happen is that a lot of Gore voters who actually liked Nader, but wanted to beat Bush would also vote for Nader. So I yes, think that exactly. is the, the, the point here on the advantages of it. So, all right, Owen, where are we at? Do we want to move on or do you want to ask your question? We got 30 seconds. Uh, Kaylee, if you can answer in 30 seconds, um, you alluded to multiple rounds in Oakland. I, are there necessarily multiple rounds in approval voting? I didn't catch that, but you only got 15 seconds to answer. <laughs> that was a uh, ranked choice okay. in Oakland. That okay. was, and that was after eliminating the first five rounds. So that was the next 10 rounds of math of Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so there's only one election. Um, one round. And, and in approval voting, you can have one election okay. and then the person with the That's most votes it. wins or in St. Louis. That's it. Sorry. Thank you. All right. Um, so we're going to go on now to uh, ranked choice voting. If we have a little bit of time at the end, we'll, we'll happily stick around and let people talk a afterwards when we're finished. But um, we're going to go on to ranked choice voting and Emma Donahue. Um, are you all set with your screen, Emma? I'm all set, so I will get started here. Um, so let me pull up my screen real quick. Okay, so rank choice voting. Um, so the first thing we're actually going to do is uh, we like to actually show how a ranked choice voting ballot works and how the election works. So I'm going to put a link in the chat. And if everybody would go fill out, of course I lost the chat, there's the chat. Uh, if everybody would go fill out this uh, ballot real quick, we can show you how a ranked choice uh, election uh, works out. So I will give everybody a minute to uh, rank your favorite candy is what we're going with tonight. Uh, so 
in the old days, we used to do this in person. We would bring the candy. It was a lot more fun. I'm sorry, I can't send you candy through the screen. But if everybody could just do that real quick, and then we'll get started. Okay. So while we're letting people vote on that, I'm just gonna run a quick clip from Bernie Sanders about why he supports ranked choice voting. So um, there's a lot of people in this room who've been organizing to get ranked choice voting in New Hampshire and in other parts of the country, including Massachusetts, after Maine took the lead in passing ranked choice voting and having an election recently about that. I wonder if you look forward to this general election and imagine the nightmare scenario, we might call it, of independent candidates running in that general election, whether you think there would be an urgent need for states in the general election to consider having ranked choice voting or instant runoff voting so that we don't get a candidate selected who actually isn't supported by the majority of Americans. Well, I worry about this issue uh, in general. Uh, what ends up happening in many elections uh, is we vote for the lesser of two evils. So if you have three candidates, hypothetically, and I have been in you know, three person race, so this has impacted me, but it's impacted people all over the country. And you like this person the most, but polling tells you that that person is only going to get 10 or 15 percent. You really hate that person, so you're going to vote for the third person you don't particularly like, right? Well, I think that kind of disenfranchises you a bit. And I think you should have the right to vote for the candidate you believe in, uh, even if the polling suggests that he or she is at 10 or 15 percent. You can, should be able to make that vote. That's what. Uh, ranked voting is, is about. Uh, so I think if we are believing in democracy and the right for people to have the freedom to cast their ballot, not if they choose the lesser of two evils, that is something uh, that I support. Okay. Okay, so uh, as we mentioned earlier, I'm here with Ranked Choice Voting for Colorado. We're a voter-centered organization that is working to make sure that all ballots and all voters' voices are heard. We're a nonpartisan organization. We try very hard to make sure that we are representing all voters and not parties, and we are also a nonprofit. So what is Ranked Choice Voting exactly? Um, there's many ways to rank things. Oh. Did not mean to do that. There are many things to rank things, but we have a very specific version that we are referencing to when we talk. It's a, it's a instant runoff voting, so IRV in a single winner election. Uh, so that is where your candidates are eliminated so you get somebody who has over 50%. The other version is single transferable vote, which is how you do a rank choice voting for a multi-winner district. So if you have uh, two at-large seats open and you're electing both at the same time, you use an STV system in order to uh, get that representation. So ranked choice voting is not any method that involves ranking. Uh, there has, these are the standards we're working with. Um, there, there has been some talk that Denver at one point used Buckland voting back in the early 1900s. That uh, voting method was eventually disbanded because it was found to not be constitutional. One vote, one, uh, one vote per voter. So this um, is a system. So we just want to, you know, lay out where we're starting with and get everybody on the same page. So what is ranked choice voting? It frees voters to vote for the candidate of their choice and feel secure about it. So in this election, we have chocolate, chocolate chip, and peanut butter. And so my first choice is chocolate chip. Second is chocolate, and I guess I'll take the peanut butter if it's all I got. I'd rather have a cookie than no cookie. Um, so that's this. I did see a question in the chat about write-ins in a uh, normal election, and this is how Denver would set theirs up. There would just be a 
fourth box underneath the peanut butter that said write in where you could write your name and it still have all the columns for your choices for second, third, fourth, et cetera. And you would rank that candidate just like you did any of the ones that were pre-printed. So um, what makes the tally more fair? So our CV requires that there is a majority consensus. The candidate has to get 50% plus one in order to win. So in our first round, we see chocolate got 35, chocolate chip got 25, and peanut butter got 40. Nobody hit that 50%, so we eliminate chocolate chip. And you can see that those 25 votes get moved to uh, chocolate and peanut butter. So five votes went to peanut butter, 20 votes went to chocolate, and chocolate wins at the end of the day. We have a clear majority of the voters who have picked this candidate, and we know what their intent was. This system has been used in the US for over 100 years because it promotes fairness. It protects the integrity of elections by requiring that majority, something that Denver currently does require with the runoff system and is something we would like Denver to keep do having that requirement, but you know, in a cheaper way. Um, it's safer. It helps if candidates drop out of the race. Uh, in the presidential primary this year, uh, 150,000 Colorado voters had their votes thrown out because their candidate had already dropped out of the presidential primary before our election occurred. So in an option like that, if you had voted for Pete or I can't even remember what order they dropped out in anymore, but you had voted for one of the candidates who dropped out long before our election, your second, third, fourth choice would be selected and you would still have a say in that presidential primary. And more voice. Voters freely rank the candidates for, uh, and not have to worry about vote splitting or having, as we've heard talk a lot tonight, having to pick the lesser of two evil candidates because that's the one who has more support and you really just don't want that other person. It also has some great uh, other uh, unintended consequences, uh, which it creates more debate in the, candidate, in the election. Candidates are forced to talk about the issues that matter to voters because they wanna be that second choice to voters. You don't wanna pick the candidate who was mean and threw mud at every other candidate as your second choice. You wanna pick somebody who's close to your ideas and also you know, will work with people. So you pick candidates that are willing to talk about the issues. Promotes equity. Uh, all candidates have equal opportunity and more people of color and women run and win in RCV elections. And it has that inclusion aspect. So we are getting more points of view to the table. So where is our RCB currently used? Uh, so this is our map currently, and I think we, we have to update this one. Um, Alaska voted in this November election to start using it for their statewide races. So that will be, we'll be turning Alaska to green. Um, but as you can see here in Colorado, we currently allow RCB races to be used for municipal elections and special district elections. We've had a couple towns use it, including Basalt and Telluride to elect their mayor. And you can, sit, you can also see, so we see a lot of uh, some of our, the southern states use it for military and overseas voters. Uh, and this is actually a problem that when Owen just dis, uh, discussed the issues with Denver in the beginning is that in order for us to mail the June runoff ballot, we have to mail it before the May ballot in order to get it out in time to military and overseas voters. RCB would eliminate this problem because we would only have to mail out one ballot and not have to mail out the runoff ballot. So. This would eliminate Denver's runoff system, uh, which cost the city of Denver a million dollars in 2019 to run, and would also save some money on the public financing side because they wouldn't be having to give out additional money to the runoff candidates. So it is a big saver for Denver and for Colorado Springs as well. So, um, so this uh, was a survey done about camp or campaign for issue focused. Um, this people found that, most people found that campaigns were much more positive or somewhat more positive than previous campaigns. And we have seen this in all races that as candidates learn how the system works and how to do it, the campaigns become about issues and topics and not about each other, which I think we can all agree gets old after a while. 
So uh, after Basalt did their election this year during the pandemic, uh, we did a survey asking voters how satisfied they were about the election in Basalt. And 88% of voters were satisfied with how the election system worked. They liked it and they found it easy to use, as you can see. Um, we also asked them whether they preferred RCV or our current pick one priority system. And overwhelming, they liked RCV much better than pick one, which I think most people do. So, um, and they also said it was easy. 95% of voters found it easy to use. So, and another, so question we get often is, will RCV confuse voters? It's a new system. It's a, it looks different on the ballot. Uh, you, you know, we want to make sure that everybody is able to express their voice th and their vote. So the data we have found that our uh, voters have not had an issue with RCV around the country. A survey out of Santa Fe said that 87.4% of voters had a favorable opinion of the ballot they used. We've also found that they're actually spoilage rates of ballots go down in an RCV system. Um, People find the grid easier to look at than sometimes just the row of names. And so you don't have that where you meant to circle the bubble for candidate B, but you missed, you know, read it and then you circled for C instead. So it, it makes it an easier voting system. And will voters like it? 95% of voters have been satisfied with their RCB uh, experience so far. And here is some data about uh, Minneapolis. They have been using RCV in their municipal elections for quite a while now. And so we have some good comparison data. Um, and as you can see, people are finding the election, the system to be simple. Less people keep finding it difficult as, the, as it gets used over elections. And the support for it goes up as well. So support from uh, RCV being continued to use in municipal election has continued to grow through 2017. Okay, and that is where I'm going to leave it and I will open it up for questions now. Um, I do wanna, I will hit a few things that I know we've talked about. Um, currently Denver's election system can handle an RCV election. The software is installed in it already. We just need to get the license to be able to use it. So Denver is able to use the system right away. Uh, we, the city of Boulder voted it this November to start using RCV in 2023 to elect their mayor. So they will be the first major city to start, uh, that has voted to actually start using RCV for a municipal election. There is legislation ongoing, that, or that will be going to, uh, sorry, there's legislation this year in the state house that will allow for the changes in the election code for counties to run municipal RCV elections in a coordinated election and to be able to change, as we said earlier, change those rules about um, being able to mark more than one candidate on a ballot. And yes, I think that's everything. So I will open it up to questions now. Weston, right. looks like you're the first one with the hand up. Yeah, um, I had a question specific to, what was it that you mentioned Buckley voting? That uh, was. Yeah. Uh, it was Buckland yeah. voting. Buckland, okay, and it was take, taken away because it was deemed unconstitutional because you could vote more than once. Could you elaborate on that and like why that is and like why maybe approval voting wouldn't fall under a category like that because you are technically voting for more than one person, but it is increasing the sum the in, the entire tally of votes. So I can see how it negates it but yeah I don't know I, I just have um, I guess hesitancy over believing it would stay in place if, if there is a concern about like the idea of a vote counting more than once which it technically would in approval yes uh, so Buckland voting is was a similar ranking system to what um, RCV is now but um, the problem was the way this is RCV system works that we're put, uh, talking about today is that your vote is only in one bucket at a time. So we do all our first round buckets. And then when your, you know, the lowest candidate um, who didn't get, um, 
you know, the lowest candidate of voters, they're, they're eliminated. So then you go back and you look in that bucket and you pull out all the voters' second choices and you re-put them into the, the buckets where they belong. So that person's vote is only ever being counted at once at one time. Buckland voting, had the way they did the tallies, allowed the um, votes to be in multiple buckets at the same time. So people were voting for multiple candidates at the same time, which then gives them too many votes. So we're running on having vote totals that were greater than the votes cast. The, the people that the cast people. them, right? Yes. Yes. And that's what I'm saying with approval voting. That's exactly what that is. Like you're voting, you're approving of everyone that you like on the ballot. Mm -hmm. And then you take the total sum, right? And that's what was explained at least, right? So yeah. if that's the case, then your votes are going to be in more than one bucket simultaneously the entire time. And I, I would be concerned about the idea of it being cemented and staying in place if, you know, some court ruled that it was unconstitutional. Yeah, um, that is a, is a concern. There has been no legal challenges to approval voting so far. Um, but and so we don't have any legal opinions on it one way or the other. So, but um, that is a concern. Okay, cool. Thank you. That's just all I was asking. Owen, I see your hand. Yeah, um, I just got a question. You mentioned um, having, it, it promotes equity and you get more diverse candidates running. I think you, I think you tied those together. Can you explain in more detail how that works? Why? why ranked choice voting gets a more diverse candidate field and, and gets you more equity in, in terms of candidates? Uh, yes, so more equity. Um, RCV gets, uh, it allows people who nor don't normally succeed well in our current polarity system because of money. Um, elections are incredibly expensive to run, as we all know. Um, but you change your tactics dramatically when you run an RCV election. So you don't need to send out that, you know, those three anti-mailer pieces against your opponents. You don't need to send out some of that. So it, it allows more people who wouldn't normally, you know, be able to afford to jump into elections a way to do it. It also brings in my di more diversity because as we've talked, um, it allows people to more clearly show their preference for the candidates overall and not just picking one or the other. And so by, you're not afraid to pick that third party candidate who you think might not win, have as much chance because you know you can also vote for a second and a third candidate. Um, and there are some very great details and I'll actually put in a um, study a link. There's a great study out of the Bay Area that actually looked at five cities that implemented RCV and then used five control cities that did not implement RCV but were statistically the same. And they went through and under the RCV system, women and people of color were elected by over 20 points more often than in a traditional system. So I will put that link in because it, it explains it way more um, eloquently than I'm going to be able to say right now. So let me put that in, uh, I will put that in the chat. But Pretty much people have found that by having the more options, it gives people who would normally be pushed out of the election because people say, oh, you're going to split the black vote or the Latino vote or the whatever vote, it allows them to stay in the race and people can really start talking about the issues more and not making sure that, you know, their minority is going to get pushed out of the system. And I'll add, I think that's why in, um ranked choice why we see more people of color and more women not only getting into the race but winning. Another feature is that because you aren't telling your voters to bullet vote, you're asking for those, you're asking to be number one in the alternative, perhaps, you know, can I be your second choice? You're having to acknowledge those other points of view. So it, what it really does is encourage, you know, community building and uh, talking about the issues as opposed to pretending that the other candidates aren't even in the race. So that's one of the features that we've seen over the decades of use of ranked choice. And I'm not sure if you had a chance to introduce yourself uh, on screen. Um, and, okay. and could you uh, say something about bullet voting, what that is? What, what do you mean by bullet voting? 
Oh, okay, so yes, I will introduce myself on screen. As I am Linda Templin, Executive Director at RCV for Colorado, and um, a volunteer now for going on four years straight. So <clears throat> uh, anyway, moving on from that, um, this has uh, what bullet voting is, and this happens all the time in, let's say, school board races, where you can vote for several candidates, but you know you're going to hurt your very favorite if you vote for more than one candidate. So let's say I like um, Bernie and I like Liz Warren. If I vote for both of them for school board, I'm watering down my um, support for Bernie because that's more than one vote in the race. And so, you know, and we have that in school board and other races like that because, you know, you're limited to the number of seats to be filled. So that's why it, it can happen. That's why we have anything similar to approvals. But that's, that's what um, bullet voting is. And there was a, a study done in Fargo where they called up hundreds of voters and asked them about how they voted and why. And the ones who voted for just one candidate um, 33% of them did so strategically because they knew it would hurt their um, favorite if they approved a second candidate. So, and what we've seen for ranked choice as far as strategy, um, Nita's strategy as, you know, is not a, a successful one. So you can't do a, you can't successfully gain ranked choice. So by putting Liz Warren way down on the rankings, what happens if Bernie's eliminated, then you get meh. Your number three candidate is where your vote goes to. So you end up with not something that is as close to what it is you truly want. So that's, that's the difference there. Okay, uh, Cleo, I see your hand raised. Yeah, Emma, I, I, I may be a little naive on the map, the uh, graph that you showed when you had three uh, to be able to vote for three in ranked choice and you eliminated the chocolate chip and automatically gave it to the chocolate. And I'm just trying to figure out why those particular votes were not split and instead given it to the chocolate versus the peanut butter. I couldn't understand why either you didn't split the votes or why you went that direction and not the other one. So we did split the votes. So there's 25 votes from chocolate chip and 25, out of those 25 voters who voted for chocolate chip first, 20 of them then voted for chocolate second. Okay. So we took their second choice and those 20 votes went over to chocolate and four, five people voted as peanut butter for their second choice. So those five went to peanut butter. So if you had candidates in real life uh, situations, and let's say you had five candidates and you end up eliminating one or two, and you might be just eliminating one or two, how do you figure, again, you're figuring on percentages, a number of votes cast? No, so you're actually taking their, people's actual votes. Um, yeah. So when the bottom candidate's eliminated, you go back and you look at all your ballots who picked that person first. Right. So you have 20 ballots you pick who picked candidate D. Mm -hmm. And you go in and you see who their second choice person was. So if five voted for candidate A and 10 voted for candidate B, five votes would go over to candidate A's count, 10 votes would go to candidate B's count, and the last five, you know, were split between the other two. So one here, one there. Okay. Um, so we're actually, yeah, we're directly taking pe what people want. It's not um, just a guess on everything. This allows you to fully decide the whole ballot of where you think they are, the candidates rank for you. One is you love, five is yeah, I guess he's on the ballot. <laughs> so you can go through and rank and then, yeah, the, the machines actually go through and then just find what your second and third choices were and put those in the correct buckets. So is there potential for a runoff on that situa in that situation? So that's the best thing is, this is why it's called an instant runoff system. So the system just eliminates candidates from the bottom until you get the candidate who gets over 50%. So it does the runoff system automatically. And so we don't have to send out another ballot with the top two candidates on it to, to voters who then, you know, go, but I just voted three weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> yeah. 
don't turn it in, don't, or, you know, they go, oh, I don't like either of these people. <laughs> so it, it does all the preferences in one shot. And so that we don't have to go back to voters again and be like, okay, well now we have these two people, what do you think? <laughs> okay. And I'm actually, I will do a screen share again real quick. And I'm going to show the results from our actual candy election this evening. There's my candy. Um, was I getting a hand signal there? That's just a five minute warning, yep. Or uh, actually it's four minutes. Okay, now. thanks. Well, so in this vote, <laughs> which is not the most exciting vote here, uh, Snickers took it in the first round with over 50%, so they got six votes. Skittles got two, Peanut Butter Cup got one, and Kit Kat got one. Um, so, you know, this isn't the most exciting election, but this is actually the most accurate kind of example of this, is that about 90% of uh, ranked choice ballot elections are decided in the first round. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, and often, you know, we see that uh, the incumbency rate doesn't change for candidates at RCV uh, as compared to the Pravati uh, system. Um, but so, um, this, yeah, this was, uh, people like Snickers here, good to know. Um, but if this hadn't been, you know, and if, if Snickers hadn't taken it 50% in the first round, we would have eliminated either pen, peanut butter or Kit Kat. Usually they don't tie in the last spot, so you don't usually have this problem, but under Colorado state law, you would flip a coin and then decide who, um, who was eliminated. So then you get into some wonky election law, so we'll skip that for tonight. Um, but yes, what else can I answer? How, how long has this idea, you know, I'm, I, I, of course, I've heard of ranked choice voting, but I had actually never heard of approval voting is I'm just wondering is has that the idea of the ranked choice voting been around longer or is it just that I'm, I'm not up to speed. Uh, yeah, ranked choice voting has been uh, around longer and used a lot longer. Um, we've used it in the U.S. here for about 100 years, and you look back, it's also been used in Europe, uh, Australia, in their elections for a very long time. So um, it is a system that has been tried out in many different political systems. Two-minute warning. Okay. we got two minutes. Who's got a question? I'm guessing a lot of people here have heard about ranked choice voting, and so approval voting was new to a lot of us. Yeah. Oh, so Felix is saying approval was in 1970, so it is a lot newer. Got it. Anybody else have a final question? Where, where has it been in place the longest, roughly? Um. Rank choice? Yeah. Yes. Um, let's see. In Ireland, they've been using it for over 100 years. I want to say uh, Cambridge has been using it for 75 years. It um, was part of the Progressive Era reforms, and then um, it kind of got rolled back during the Red Scare. So, anyway. One minute left. Australia has been using it a long time as well. So. Okay. Do you think if we had used this in the Democratic primaries, do you think Bernie would have been the winner? Just asking, hypothetical. <laughs> uh, we do so. We we've done some hypothetical, you know, guessing on some of the election results. Um, there's a there's a chance, um, yeah, that it it could have gone a different way. Um, you know, we don't like to speculate too much because we don't have anybody's second or third preferences on ballots, so we don't really have any data for those to work off of. Mm -hmm. But based on, you know, support and things, we it, I think it would have been a different turnout. Yeah, it's all about the turnout. We did some um, polls online and um, Liz Warren did really well as the more moderate, as the, you know, and um, more conservative Dems got eliminated, it started to aggregate towards Bernie. So in the case- I got to cut you off there because we're at we're out of time uh, the allotted time there. But like I said, we will um, 
keep the room open if people want to keep talking, but just out of fairness, going to cut you both off at the same amount of time. Um, so thanks to uh, both groups and for uh, all four of the featured speakers today. Um, you guys were great. Uh, that's really informative. We will post this um, and uh, try to, you know, so if you have folks that would, would like to see it, please um, encourage them to come see it. Uh, and I would maybe put out a pitch there also that with, um, you know, the charter committee trying to uh, come up with conclusions and recommendations soon. Did you say in the next couple of weeks, somebody? Um, uh, yeah, the Denver Charter Committee is having their last official meeting on the 18th, and then they'll be starting to make some recommendations after that. Right. So this would be a good time to be contacting members of the committee, which I know on council includes um, uh, the council president, whose name I'm spacing out from uh, Stacy Gilmore, Stacey and, Gilmore Kevin and, and Kevin Flynn. So those members of council are on that charter committee. Um, the clerk's office also, but also your own council person, if you or your at large council people, if you want to let them know where you stand about these um, options for voting. And again, uh, rank choice and approval voting are two things they're looking at, but they're also looking at um, whether to just go with the plurality instead of a majority um, or whether to stick with what we've got and find a way to have more time between elections. Um, they're all kind of bunched up right now <clears throat> and getting into that time crunch. So it is a good time to contact your council member um, with your opinion about alternative voting methods for Denver's future. And I, I will just say uh, the Denver Charter Review Committee has a survey out right now. They are looking for citizen feedback. So I just stuck that in the chat if you want okay. to take their survey. Thanks. Um, any final announcements before we uh, formally close the meeting? I have a question. This is yeah. Skip. Yeah. Just quickly, there was a number of links that were put in the chat. A lot of that's probably going to disappear after the, this is over. Can somebody put that together and send it to us in an email, please? Uh, I can I'll copy and paste it to you in, in an email. I mean, all of it, or the ones for RCV and approval yeah, both. There's a lot of stuff I want to look up, but I can't screenshot everything. It keeps moving uh, too fast. So, Felix, you'll just copy the whole chat and send it to Skip. And then, Skip, you could distribute that uh, to everybody from there if you wanted to. I'd be happy to distribute Great. it to everybody, yes. Yeah. And, Linda, I promise I won't edit it. I know. <laughs> I, pro I appreciate that. Thank you, Felix. Mm -hmm. Any yeah, other announcements? Please send, yeah, please send it out to to us. That would be great. All those links. I got some. Thank you. Terry, Thanks. thank you. So uh, look for uh, uh, more word from our revolution in the coming month. Obviously, we'll have another meeting coming up in, in a month at our second Wednesday at the Merck. I think it's exactly a month from today or four weeks from today. Um, so uh, March uh, 10th. Look for us back here at the Merck, virtually. Tip your waiters, please, and your uh, wait staff. Um, and uh, I think also, you know, uh, look for more input from us in the coming weeks on um, how we can help uh, advance Medicare for all. I know there's a meeting coming up with Senator Bennett, and if you'd like to, um, Pat, we've already had one with Hickenlooper, but if you'd like to pass feedback in on on healthcare. Uh, that we can uh, ask Senator Bennett about. Feel free to uh, contact any of the Our Revolution folks here, including me. Um, and uh, Green New Deal is gonna be a top priority this year. And as we've been talking about, as it's come up, I think in everybody's presentations, um, with uh, campaign finance reform, Denver has already enacted major finance reform that's going into effect is in effect now in the current cycle for 2023. So uh, we've got, you know, hopefully so far every candidate known who's running is opted in for public financing. And we're also very close to getting this passed on the national level with the change in Congress and, and the White House this year. Uh, we're suddenly in good position to get uh, public financing and serious voter reform on the national level. So we'll be coming at you on all those fronts very soon on actions you can take to help promote those 
top priorities for our revolution. Uh, again, feel free to stick around and chat if you'd like. We'll keep the room open as long as people want to stick around here within reason. And thanks again for everybody for coming. Hope to see you next month. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all for a great presentation. Good night. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all. Good night. All right. Thanks, everyone. Go ahead and stop the recording.